Um, mm-hmm. In 81, you guys moved into the Alan Jones phase of uh, right. your right. career. And Alan Jones, of course, was the uh, producer and kind of some Svengali, if you will, behind the Barquets. Right. Um, when right. they came back in the late 70s and they were very successful into the 80s. So you right. got that kind of Memphis funk thing going. And right. uh, the Blue Jeans album in 81, that is, you know, a lot of it sounds like the Barquets, frankly, but it is mm. really funky. You cannot deny that is a hard hitting record. Yeah, we, um, this was an ironic situation. It was, it was, uh, all uncomfortable, it was crazy as can be. Uh, getting to Alan Jones was a, was a fight because we went to George Tolman, as I told you before, and we did Studio City, and when we did that album, that album, according to RCA, uh, it was a nice album, but it flopped financially. It didn't, do it, it didn't do well. It didn't do like our other records, and then there was musical chairs again, and they changed it. And so everybody was, was on a uh, chopping block, so to speak. So it's a, it was a do it or else. And so it was the, 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 the new people on the block at RCA and also us. It was like, y'all got to come up with something or else. So uh, we were saying, well, we'll, we'll we're not going to go back to George Tobin. We'll just go back to the total experience and we'll try it over there. And then, uh, and then at the time, Alan Toussaint was, uh, we were ready to get away from them. And so all of that, getting contracts different and trying to share our, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what we call our wonderful rights with them. I mean, because even after you, you, the contract is up, you still have to give them a piece of the pie because it is what it is. But anyway, when we got to to go back to the total experience, they changed chairs in RCA. And RCA said, right then, we all got to come up with a funky song. Y'all just got to come up with some funk. Because, you know, what y'all came up with before, you know, that's not what we, y'all got to come up with, y'all, some funk. And, and uh, Ray Harris came back and he said, you know what, um, guys, I, didn't, I talked with this guy, Alan Jones, and I know him, and da 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 and uh, he's a funky guy, and you know the Barquets. And I said m- myself, oh, yeah, I remember the Barquets when I was like 11 or 12. I used to see them coming around concerts with Isaac Hayes. I mean, I, they used to, Isaac Hayes used to be, they used to open up for Isaac Hayes and a whole bit, and, you know, and when he was Moses. I remember the Barquets when I was young. I, mean, I remember them. And say, that's what you, you say, yeah, well, we, we, we thinking y'all need to come with some funk. They funky. Y'all need to come up with some funk, you know, go to that, uh, go see Alan Jones. So that was our back was against the wall. We had we didn't have an that was the ultimatum. We either do that or uh, get the blown off the off the company. And so we went there. And when we went there with Alan Jones, Alan Jones could only do one one thing, and that was the funk. He could only do the bar case because Alan Jones was really the bar case, and I didn't know that, but he actually was that. And he didn't play an instrument. He didn't. He just had all of that in his head, but he didn't. Pl- he didn't play anything. But uh, funk, he could do. He could drink coffee all day, black coffee all day. Sit down, drink black coffee. I never seen him eat. And he would just come up with ideas of funk. But he, he had a stooge, uh, what you call a stooge, a, a, a right-hand person. And, 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 and the Barquets had Winston. And Winston would play these uh, Winston crazy synthesizers. Winston Stewart, yeah. Play these crazy synthesizer licks. And he was so good at it. I mean, he was just like, mm, he'd play him. And so our, what we had to do is we had Robert Dab on, and, and Robert was a good, great keyboardist, but he wasn't funky, funky like that. I mean, this guy was funky. So we had to go get another keyboard player, Michael Goods at the time. And so this guy was called Michael Goods, and he would take like well, almost a school lesson with Winston. Like whatever Winston would be playing, he copy it and copy it and copy it and alan jones would would welcome it and so because he couldn't play himself he would just be saying he, they just had a communication going on he'd look at winston and he'd say winston i need something here and this phrase i need you to do he'd do like that and winston would play and he'd say yeah that's it now 
put put a little twang on it and and wants to know exactly what he's saying exactly <laughs> and because uh, either he knew exactly what he's saying i didn't know it but he knew it when he heard it kind of like bernie warrell with george clinton kind of kind of like bernie exactly exactly now you got it now you got it that's kind of how that worked and so that was a new experience that i had with that and then i met another michael then this michael played with uh, Otis Redding, and he played guitar, and and Mike can play that guitar. But he was he played with Otis Redding when he was twelve or thirteen years old. When I when we met him, he was like thirty. So that was a lot of years in the studio. But anyway, um, and in fact, he might have been older than thirty. Might have been, but but anyway, he remembers all the oldest spreading things and the time and da, da da da. But ironically, like I said, I grew up on forty fives. Oldest Redding was my man. Like I used to sing all his songs. I was in the studio, and I heard Mike, and Mike was playing the changes on, uh, uh, "I've Been Loving You Too Long," and he was just playing them. And then I just sat in the studio, and I just start singing. Ah been loving you and I was just going through the whole bit and, and the whole studio got quiet and uh, Alan Jones went in the studio back while he turned the lights out and it's just him and I and they put the spotlight on the guitar and I was just sitting down with him singing it and they were recording it and didn't know that and and, and they Which stopped and then they came, they came to the back and they say you know what I already found out that you're going to do this song. You're going to cover this song. And I was like, you know, we're going to do this again. We're going to do it with a band, and we're going to do this and get a ranger and da 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 and, and the whole bit. And so that was our relationship with, with Alan Jones. That was the relationship of it. And I began to respect him as he respected me. He pushed me. As, as a producer, he pushed me better than any other producer we had. Um, because... Um, he couldn't sing, and he knew he couldn't sing. It wasn't like Alan Toussaint. He he couldn't sing. He knew he couldn't sing, and he would just go eh, and I would try to learn his communication skills as as he would do with Winston, and I tried to learn that, and I would miss and hit and miss and miss until I actually I got good at what he wanted, and so he always loved high things. So I always tried to give him that. So when we had take it off, and that was a that was a big challenge for me to take it off. Um, but we worked and we worked and we worked, and you could see the you could see the benefits from all of it coming, you know. And from then, uh, you know, after we did take it off, we put it on the back burner. And then he said, you know what? I want to see how you feel doing uh, sugar, sugar foot stuff, you know? And I was like, well, bring it on, because I used to tour with it. So, like, whatever. Well, I got a song, you know, and they say called Blue Jeans, and I want you to try it, you know, Blue Jeans and the track. And I hated it. I listened to it, and I said, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. And he said, yeah, but, you know, it has possibilities. So I said, I don't like so he said, well, just try it. And so we tried it as a band, and it sounded so different from, from the original track. And it was funky as I don't know what. And so uh, I was sold on it. And then he said, well, let's change the key. And so we changed the key in the whole bit, and we just took it to a whole nother level. And, uh, and then uh, Larry Dawson started fussing with Alan Jones about uh, us having that Blue Jean song because he said that uh, Alan had first given them that song first and that we took it from them. And, but it was only after they heard what we did to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it could have went either way, but that was the, the big discussion. So to, 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 to make amends and to make it right, Alan Jones said, you know what, y'all going to share that. Da, da, da. So Whenever the Barcades do a song, the horn players, we need you, the horn players, to come play for them. So Hit and Run and all those songs that they were doing, that Barcades, Chocolate Milk was playing on, the horn players. Were. They weren't using me because I was a competition. So, 
So I didn't put I didn't do the vocals on. But a lot of the vocals, what he did do, um, like on um, Who's Getting It Now, he had Larry Dobson sing it first. And uh, and I think Larry might have wrote it. I'm not sure. But because uh, they had their own kind of uh, relationship, Alan Jones and the Bar Case. But anyway, he would, he's singing on it. And he had me sing over it. Which track? Uh, it's called Who's Getting It? Who's Getting It Now? Uh, it's a song called I Oh Took yeah. For yeah, and that's got it. Mm. I love the groove of that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh so he sang it and put it over it. I but I took it to another level. I had to tell me, baby. So I kinda I, I'm I'm kinda good at what I hear. Like I told you, as a kid I've always been good at uh hearing the notes before they and then anticipating them before they before they actually come so i was actually when the track was going on i was actually hearing it and doing it and that was killing alan jones he was like did you hear the song before and i said no i i never heard it before and he said uh well we just did this song and and like you went and hit the note and i and i was gonna tell you to hit that note but you hit the note anyway so i mean we're good i just didn't know that you hear this before and i was like no I've never heard it before, but in my mind, I've heard it before. I pulled it off from way back and were, were, knew where I was going. Were you concerned? That was who's getting it. Mm -hmm. But were you concerned at all about sounding too much like Larry Dobson on on that song, or was were you good with? It? Well, the the whole the whole Memphis thing, I was against. I was against all of it because I felt that they weren't letting me be me, and they was not going to let me be me. But, I, but here was the deal. The deal was that they were giving me, and I was a young kid, so the deal they were giving me is that if we don't sell this album, RCA is going to drop us. Yeah. We're gone. So my deal is either I have to play ball with these people or I have to go find another label. I got you. And so that was the deal. So I had to figure out how to be Larry Dobson, but at the same time try to be me too. And figure that out, and so well, that was to, the hard part. To be honest with you, there's a lot worse fates than that. I mean, because yeah. you know, Larry Dodson yeah. is one of the great funk singers uh, in my yeah. mind, and also, yeah. uh, you know, the Barquet's music is among the funkiest music yeah. there is. So, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Your love is like the Holy Ghost was funky. Oh man, the Holy Ghost was funky, funky. They had the Holy Ghost for real in there, you know. So. Yeah, Larry, all of them were, fun. like I said, I saw them when I was young, and I always loved them. I never thought I would be meeting them or even be singing with them. I never thought that at all. Uh, yeah, I, I, saw, I didn't see him live, but seeing him do Son of Shaft in Wattstack, wow, mm -hmm. that was incredible. Well, they yeah. were in the studio doing Shaft. Well, actually, when, um, when Isaac Hayes did the concert, and I was young, and um, when they did Tom, da da when they was doing that part, uh, that was again Larry Dobson's band doing that. The bass Alex Alexander, James Alexander, I think James, James, James on bass, and they were doing all of that stuff. I was just young. I didn't realize that, didn't know it, but uh, and I got a chance to meet these guys, but they were the guys that that was the, the meat behind Isaac Hayes. They were the yeah. meat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I, want, I want to mention some other specifics about that Blue Jeans record, the album. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the song was a hit. Yeah, I don't know how much it played in the East Coast, but it did pretty well out here on the West Coast. Blue Jeans album, Blue Jeans song was the biggest song Chocolate Milk ever had. The biggest song. But we have we had bad luck. And so I don't know if that goes with the, the company and all of that. The bad luck was um, when that song was presented to us, no one knew who wrote the song. Um, and then this guy came out out of nowhere, Howard Redmond said, I wrote this. And so that was the thing, you know, I wrote the song, da, 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 da. So we put on the album, Howard Redman wrote Blue Jeans. That was the song. He was a little thug guy, you know, that came and he said he wrote it. So, you know, yeah. so we here we using it. Then the record company says that there's a suit out that, um, over the person who wrote the song and who didn't write the song and da 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 da, so they, I think what that hurt the record because by the time it got to be twenty plus and 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 we never had a crossover twenty 
I mean, that was the top 20 song, Blue Jeans, uh, in the Billboard charts. We never had that. And, 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 and uh, we've always had like a 15, top 15 song, but that was an R&B. This was a pop uh, on charts, top 20 song. And as soon as that hit the bullet, the top 20 song, you could see the, the, the aggression of promoting it and putting it out was a problem. And it the air went out the balloon. Radio play. It, yeah, it went out like a, like a, yeah. And, 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 and the reasoning, because again, there was a fight between who had the, who wrote the song mm-hmm. and what that was. And so we lost that. So we had, and we had other follow-ups. If, if that would have took off, we had other songs. I mean, we had Funky Honey Buns was funky. Honey, honey Bun was killer. So, and yeah, you remember yeah. Honey Buns. So uh, Honey Buns was funky, and I thought that was gonna be the next one. If, if Blue Jeans make it, I always said that, that, that that's gonna be Honey Buns gonna be the one. But because it fizzled the way it fizzled, and and, and like I said, RCA p- played a good part on on not really doing that what they do. Uh, we lost out on that. We lost out on that. It was a pretty big album. It was funky album, it was just as good. The, the, like I said, the difference between um, us and the Barcades is their label. What they had people behind because of their record and reputation. They had, but when when Barcades put out a record, their record was on. That hit and run. When they when we put out Blue Jeans, they put out Hit and Run. When they put out Hit and Run, that sucked, that thing just took. That's off. one of their biggest hits. Yeah. Yeah, Hit and Run just took off. This record of Blue Jeans, I don't want to get away without also mentioning um, Mm -hmm. Honey Bun is killer. Um, Mm -hmm. But also um, Running on Empty was like a radio-ready funk kind of sound, um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. kind of was reflecting the times to me in that it was Mm -hmm. sort of like um, Mm -hmm. a little bit more like Mm -hmm. like a Midnight Star was starting to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Kind mm -hmm. of that Mm electro-funk influence coming Mm -hmm. in. That's right. um, Video Queen too. We we actually tried to get something uh, from Video Queen that had that kind of uh, uh, digital games and the whole thing about. So we was trying to get into video games and that kind of thing and that. And so that came right after we did the uh, the uh, running on empty. So we had it at the store. We just didn't put it put it out, but we had that. As soon as we did running on empty, we did something like that and put it on the back burner. And then it wound up coming up on our album again, but. Uh, but anyway, to answer your question, yeah, that was that was the vibe, and that was the time for running on empty, and uh, uh, it was a challenge to do that song. Actually, that was one of the big challenges to do that song. You know, you know what also leaped out to me in the credits, Frank, is uh, one Neo Nocentelli was on the guitar on some of that somewhere. He's on the credits. When um, when we got to when we got to Memphis and we started to do this, um, we wanted to be as funky as possible. And that, that was the, the thing with Alan Jones also. He loved the funk and the whole bit. And Mike is already, he's an uh, 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 older shredding kind of guy. He come from that era and he was funky too. Oh. So we met Leo. I think he just came to visit or something at a club and we met him and we talked to him and and we were like, man, Leo, we're doing the album. He said, man, why don't you call me? You know, I, I, I'll come and do some things. He said, yeah, well, you know, we're doing funky stuff, so it, it would fit. So it was that, that kind of thing. We knew already Leo because Leo was from home, down home. I mean, we, we knew him. And uh, he kind of looked at us as, little, as his little baby brothers, kind of like, you know. So uh, Leo was always funky. So when he got in that studio, he killed it. And he was being Leo. And... Uh, he raised eyebrows with all of them. I mean, you know, Memphis knew who he was. He so, can do anything on guitar. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was. He's a genius when it comes to that funk. I mean, you, he's funky. And so he raised some eyebrows. So, yeah, we had him come in and do some things, and Alan was definitely a, a for it. So there wasn't, without question, wasn't, wasn't a problem to do. And uh, all the funk started to work. I mean, we had everybody that was there. We... Um, even the drummer, even our own drummer, you know, even relinquished. He gave, he said, you know what? Hey, I want it as funky as possible. So, uh, you know, some of the songs we could use the Barquet's drummer. And he was okay with that. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of cuts we used even the Barquet's drummer. Wow. You know? mm-hmm. Well, 
that gets us to the final chocolate milk record, which was uh, Friction in 82, mm -hmm. again, produced by Alan Jones, um, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. with more of that uh, mm -hmm. arcades like funk. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Hit and Run. That one song on there, uh, Sweet Heat, actually sort of has a Hit and Run vibe to me. Well, Sweet Heat, to be honest with you, Alan Jones was that kind of a guy. He's a copycat kind of guy. Uh, he he's funky, but he's a copycat. If he's a, if it's out there, he gonna challenge it funky wise. So there was a song by Al. Uh, what's his name? Uh, can't think of his name, but she's cutie pie. Uh, oh, one way. Uh, Al Hudson. One way. Al Hudson. Uh, cutie pie was the the big song, and so he said, you know what? Uh, that cutie pie is big. If we could just pull something off like that. And so we just did a funky song like uh, like Cutie, Cutie Pie, which happens to be Sweet Heat. And so, da 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 but it, it had the same kind of feel of that. But that's kind of how that happened. Cutie Pie was a big song. And he wanted that, a funk song Too bad Sweet like Heat that. wasn't as big. I know. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I, I hate to keep saying that, but I, I really believe it in my heart is that what One Way had to promote and where they had their radio stations to, to done. RCA just didn't, they didn't, they didn't have that. They weren't. It wasn't that good at it. Yeah, they were on MCA one way. Yeah, there, there wasn't like a RCA was <laughs> not as good as as the as the others or as far as doing that. That's my opinion on it, and it's hard to criticize them with that. I mean, Evelyn Champagne King did well with with the shame that she did well with it, but it wasn't like a funk nah, record, you know. I mean, crossover. they had that he she and eventually she did get Kashif. And Kashif did some funky things with it, but it wasn't like funk, funk. And so RCA had problems with that, in my opinion. And but we're the only ones on that on that on that label. So. Well, this record, if you had to end it, to me, you went out uh, punching, you know, because it's a it's a hard hitting record. Friction. Uh, the first mm -hmm. three songs are all really like danceable funk. I mean, it just mm -hmm. gets in there, mm -hmm. and. Um, or the first four songs, and mm -hmm. uh, and then keep it coming is a nice ballad. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. To me, to me mm -hmm. it has a little bit of a cameo flavor, but that's... yeah. He said that we went on tour with them, and that's kind of where we got. It. I was like knocked out with uh, cameos, uh, choreographed performances because they would actually come out marching, and they would have that march funk to it, and they would kind of stop and pump and pump that kind of that kind of feeling, and so. Uh, Candy was like that. Can it's like candy. They were so funky. All all of their songs were baseline hard funk. Um, and so uh, when they did the slow song, which was funky, it was called uh, Star. Uh, Star. What was it? Sparkle. Sparkle. And it's called Sparkle. Well, you are on it. You're on it, guy. <laughs> you are on it, Scott. When they had Sparkle, uh, I thought about that. Uh, Keep it coming. Having it that kind of feel. And yeah. so, yeah, that was the cameo. That was the cameo feel. We are actually, like I said, we listen to a lot of things and we come up with. There was another one on there. When Prince was big, we, we did one that was um, not Adore You, but there was a song that was similar to that he did. Do Me Baby? And Do Me Baby. Oh, you're on it. Yeah, I can just, yeah. Do Me Baby was, a, and so I said, shine a light for you tonight. Don't make me wait. And we did that, and 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 that was the kind of feeling of do me, baby. That mm, that kind of and and we were in, we weren't on, we wasn't on tour with with Prince, but when we were, when we went to the clubs and stuff, and he was there in the clubs. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the kind of feel when he actually played. I, I kind of like those feels. And he had at the time he was introducing time, so. Uh, we all got a chance to meet that, you know, and how that felt. So, yeah, that's all came about around that same time. So that's how uh, uh, Don't Make Me Wait came about.
and it had that kind of Prince feel. And then the other one was naturally Michael was so such a big hit. So I had a lot of Michael influence on a lot of the songs, like what we did, uh, uh, the one I said, uh, Take It Off, and uh, the other one that says Shake Your Body, because uh, uh, Michael Jackson had to shake who's, your body down to the ground. Hmm? Who's getting it now? Is that one? Who's, who's getting it now was one, but but more importantly, the other one that's called Shake Your A lot of people call it Shake Your Body uh, because it has a two a double meaning, but that wasn't the name of it. The name of it was uh, um, May I Take Your Hand and Hold It Down Stand With You All Night Long I'll Never Miss a Beat Don't Let Up was the name of it. Don't don't let up was the name of it, but it, but it always says shake oh, yeah. your body, baby. Yeah. So shake your body actually came with the 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 Michael Jackson shake your body. So I right. do a lot of high notes screams on it and that kind of little feel of that. Uh, so yeah, I was influenced by all of it happening. So we were all kind of uh, sticking little dabs of of a little familiarity in that, you know, but the. Uh, being familiar with uh, those kinds of little things that's hit, but trying to still keep it funky. And so it's interesting um, he hearing you talk about Alan Jones because I had Larry Dodson on and mm -hmm. I didn't really know the role mm -hmm. that Alan played in the mm -hmm. Barcaves until I spoke with Larry all these mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really drove that train. So yeah. it's interesting yeah. to hear also your side of that. But yeah, Alan Jones was actually, he was Mr. Barcay. He was Mr. Barcay. Um, and they had a like a, like Winston, uh, Larry and uh, Alan had a great relationship. They he respected they respected each other, and uh, I never had that um, with Alan. With and not in that respect, he respected me, but he also had a it was like a jealousy kind of thing. With it wasn't it wasn't legitimate. Like I could see with Alan Jones and and. Uh, and and Larry, it was legitimate respect. It wasn't like no one, one wasn't jealous of the other. It wasn't that kind of. Thing. Well, he helped groom Larry from being a young singer and kind of molded him. So that was mm -hmm. a different. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a different relationship completely, and I understand yeah. that. Yeah, and so that, who, that's what came about. Actually, that's how it came off. Who is Frankie J? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of times while I was singing. And instead of uh, calling me Frank, a lot of people were just calling me Frankie all the time. And so, hey, Frankie, Frank, Frankie. And sometimes they say Frank, but sometimes they just say, hey, what's up, Frankie? What's up? You know, and that's just kind of how, how that came. But there's so many people when they say Frankie, there's a lot of people that Frankie. So I just wanted to add my middle initial, which is Joseph. Instead of saying Frankie Joe or Frankie Joseph, just Frankie J. So, so that 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 became Frankie J after a while. So uh, that's the only uh, place I saw it noted is on this final record. You know that would have been a yeah. good name to kind of then get into hip hop from there. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. <laughs> uh, but you know, at the time when I had the Frankie J, I wasn't realizing that uh, Maze also had a Frankie Beverly, but. Uh, mm -hmm. But 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 there wasn't, you know, it, it still didn't. I guess it would have been more of a problem if it would have just been Frankie, but it wasn't uh, Frankie J. So and, and it was spelled differently uh, with a Y. And I think Frankie Beverly has his with I E. But that's right. Um, that's right. But but uh, anyway, that's kind of how that came about. And uh, a lot of people call me. But but for the most part, family, everybody, everybody still called me Frank. Like every time and every now and then people say Frankie. But. Uh, you know, they'll say Frank. I want to make sure that I get across to viewers that if you select mm -hmm. on that final chocolate milk record, you got to pick it up, find it somewhere because it's solid. If you're in a funk, you're going to like it. Mm -hmm. um, so, what that happened? Friction, that friction was crazy, though. That friction album, when we did yeah. that, oh <laughs> man, yeah. And the things that can we we collaborated so well. Uh, like I said, by that time, that was our second album yeah by the by that time we were we knew alan jones's ways we knew what he was he knew us uh larry dobson we knew and he, larry knew me we were good you know we didn't hang out hang out but when we came together musically i mean we knew each other very very well so 
everybody came as a collaboration. Like we wouldn't, we didn't, it wasn't just Chocolate Milk and Alan Jones. When we came and did a record, it was all of the whole family. So all of the barcades was coming and it was like, oh, what if you put this right here? What if you scratch this right here on a guitar? What if you did this? What if you did this? So everybody had input. That's something that we didn't have before. And if we had that kind of stuff, like I said again, on RCA Records, I'm going to tell you, that's what made Earth, Wind & Fire go. What made Earth, Wind & Fire go was they had the Cavallo. They signed with a Cavallo Rufalo. I'll I never forget that. It was. A, and he went on to work with Prince. They worked with Prince after that. And they, and they worked with Prince. And they, they had a whole circle. Charles Stephanie had a whole, like the whole label would come and check them out and come in and incorporate what their views were. So they would have meetings on all of that. And so when everybody left the room, they had a one concept, what to do, how to do it. And everybody was on that one concept. We never had that. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. Um, so what led to the, uh, the demise of the group? What happened after friction? Well, there wasn't any demise. We've never, and that's the, that's the secret, I guess, what everybody did say, well, Y'all together now? And then we never broke up. We, we've been together for 40-something years. We've never, we've never broken up. The problem was, um, after we did the Friction album, remember, it was a do or die, right? So we, as a do or die, the Blue Jeans song saved us for one more album because we, it went 20 with a bullet. But it wasn't our fault that whoever said didn't write the record, da, 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 that wasn't our fault. So they excused us. We got another record with Alan Jones, another album. So we had another shot. And that album did okay, but it didn't do what Blue Jeans did. And so they let us go. And so when they let us go, by that time, I had wonderful children. I had a beautiful wife. And I decided to try to figure it out musically. I stayed in music. I taught music. I've been teaching and, you know, I did stuff like that. But whenever they say, oh, chocolate milk, we need chocolate milk to come such and such, we just get together and go do it. Uh, and it's kind of like that still now. We just not, we don't have a label and we didn't try to invest in a label. We just, whenever somebody say, I need chocolate milk to go, we just call each other. But we just played about uh, six months, three, three months ago. We just played three months ago. We played at the Jazz Fest. Uh, how, how, who, are the the who are the members now? The members are still the same. We're, God has blessed us. We still have Robert Dabon on keys. We have Joe Fox, which is uh, you know trumpet. Joe Smith. We have uh, Amadee Castanel still on sax. He's living in Boston, um, and we have uh, 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 drummer Dwight Richards. He's still there. He's still here with me, and we play together every time, every chance we get because we're kind of close. Um, and myself. And then there's an Afro Williams who was in and out the group back and forward, the percussionist. He was there and he wasn't there. Like if you go on to the Friction album and you look at that and you look at Blue Jeans, his face is not there. But on the, on the, on the Action Speak Loud and Words beginning, he's there. He's a percussion. He got himself kicked out of the group hmm. for various reasons. But he's back with us, you know, so he still plays. So he's still alive. So that's it. That's the, that's the group. Um, David Barad is still here. He's still with us, but he never was really officially a Chocolate Milk member. Remember when we got rid of Ernest Dabon uh, for his craziness? We got David Barad as a bass player, but because of that situation, we were very leery of having anybody be a part of the group. We just had him be in the group, but not a part of the group. Kind of so, like the Rolling Stones bass player. That's right. Exactly. And, you know, Cameo kind of had what they had. I mean, uh, the drummer, he, the, Cameo's face started changing like crazy. I mean, at, at one time, Cameo was the five, six guys, and then all of a sudden it was down to two and three. It was crazy. But uh, I, I, saw, I saw Cameo Frank in the late 70s. It was like about 12 of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, 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 <laughs> he, he changed them. Larry changed them. Eric Blackman. He changed them every time chance he got, you know, and that was uh, unfortunate, but it kind of worked for them, but it, it was unfortunate. He, they never had the same people. We've had the same people the whole time. It's just that, uh, like I said, bass player wise, we, we, uh, we changed that. We don't always have the same bass player. So we, we got that differently, but 
We always make sure we get a funky bass player. But everybody is the same. We still have the same keyboard player. We still have the same guitar player, Mario Teal. We still have the same drummer and the two trumpet, trumpet and, and, and sax. We still have that. The only thing funk-wise, remember, again, we were so funky that we had Leo Nascentelli. We were, we were trying to be like the Ohio players were in the studio. We were trying to be studio funky and rather than live funky. So we had Leo on guitar. We had Mike. I can't think of, I can't think of Mike's last name, but Mike O was there, and, um, and, and he played on a lot of funky stuff. And he played with Otis Reddick, so uh, I can't. I Mike can't Pizzeria, Rio or? No, no, that was, uh, my, Mike Pizzarilla was the guitar player for the other album. But uh, this guy was on the. Um, Michael Tolles? He, Michael Tolles. Michael Tolles. Wait, 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 wait. Michael Toes. Yeah, Michael Toes. That's it. Michael Toes. I'm trying to remember the other. Uh, wait, Michael Toes is the keyboard. Michael, Michael Toes played keyboard. That's the one we added to try to help Win Winston. To try no, to keep here, up with Winston. Uh, here it says Michael Toes for guitar after Leo. No, okay, well, that's, that's Michael Toes. That's him. Michael Toes. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. trying to remember who's the, who's the keyboard guy. We have a keyboard guy. Not, not Robert Dabon, but. Uh, what Robert, that no, no not Robert, not Robert. Um, he's on, he's on, he's inside of that. He was never on the. Oh, Michael album. Goods. Michael Goods, that's the Michael. That Michael Goods. I'm, I, that was I'm getting them mixed up. Michael Toes, though, is the one I'm talking. About. Impressive. Michael. I remembered all that. Yeah, that I you're so like you're so <laughs> impressive. You're so impressive. Uh, again, accolades to you. You're right on it. But yeah, that was Michael Toes. Michael Toes was funky. I mean, like when you say funky, oh man, he was funky. He was funky. He was funky than Leo to me in a different way. There were different styles, but That's but we had we had, we had Michael Toes. Yeah, we had we had some people. So when we go on stage, I don't have that. So the problem that we have now when we play, it's hard for us to play blue jeans. For me, for me, it's hard to play blue jeans. I feel like Ohio players when 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 I'm trying to do blue jeans. I feel like Ohio players because Ohio players was great in the studio. They were terrible on stage. They couldn't pull it off. Um, we couldn't. We can't pull off blue jeans like like I would like it to be pulled off. Mm -hmm. It's just funky. We had Winston. I mean, that, listen to the people we had on there. Michael Toes just complimented Winston. And then we had Robert Dabon, which we already had. We, he still played his funky. And then, and then we had Michael Toes, Mario Teo, our own guitarist. We didn't even use him. That's how funky it was. We had no place for him. So we had Michael, and then we had Leo, and then we had a, the guitar player from the Barcades. I can't think of his name. He was funky. He had the long hair. Yeah, his name was Michael, too. Yeah, I can't think of his name. I can't no, think no, of his Lloyd. name. But Michael Lloyd. Lloyd. That was it. That was it. The Michael Lord. And he was funky. So we had enough guitar players funking it up. So along with the keyboards funking it up, and they were playing synthesizers that had guitar sounds in it. Oh man. So we were funky all the way through. So I couldn't we couldn't duplicate that on a live stage. So blue jeans didn't blue jeans didn't take off live to me the way all oh, the others did. Now we could do girl calling. I could do that in my sleep. Have you guys have you guys ever uh, thought about going back and making any new music or? Uh, only because, like I told you before, uh, I'm an older guy now. Um, I wrote most of the songs, if not all of them, pretty much. The only way we can fly is if I write the songs. The problem with me is now is that if I write the songs. It's gonna be mine. Like I, it's, and I have spoiled them to the point that whatever I wrote, we all share. I don't want that anymore. So it's hard for me because now if I write a song and it's my song, they're gonna feel some kind of way about it. It is what it is. And so I've been holding my songs. I have my daughter with me. My daughter is Dawn. And we were older guy, but it, you might still remember in 2004, there was a group called, not a group, a, a television show called Making the Band 3. D P. Diddy had this show. It was almost like American Idol, 
where you have youngsters come up and, and form a band. But you form a band in a, in a form, they call it a band, but it's a group like, like in, in, uh, like, uh, in sync and Backstreet. So it was like that, but it was a girl, it was a girl group. And then they called it a girl band. It's called Making a Band. And my daughter was a part of that. She went out with about 10,000 girls to audition, just like American Idol for it. It mm -hmm. went down to five. And so they went double platinum. If you go look at it, it's called Danity King. She came up with the oh. name when she was a young. Yeah, I know Danity that. King. Yeah. And it went double platinum the very first time it went out. Wow. Yeah, the billboard, Danity King. Very first time it went out. When the, didn't get a lot of radio play, but it was crazy. They had a following like you wouldn't believe. So we went double platinum, and then they put out the second album, and that went double platinum. And it's now supposedly on record and billboard as the only girl group. And you know we had a lot of girl groups. It's the only girl group that ever had back-to-back -back consecutive double platinum albums. Wow. They've never had any other girl group do that. And your daughter's so in that? And da my daughter's in it. Yeah, Dawn. What's her first Dawn. name? D-A-W-N, Dawn. D -A -W -N, Dawn. She, there are two uh, what we would call African-American girls, but one is from Atlanta and the other one is from New Orleans, and that's my daughter. Uh, Congratulations. And the other, the other three girls, Shannon and Aubrey, they're from, uh, uh, Aubrey's from L.A. And uh, then we also had what we call a Spanish girl. She's kind of Andrea Frembrace. You know, you know did, so, did, he, did he take like production credit on that or something? He took all of it. Danny the Kane came from my daughter's uh, writing. She used to she used to write uh, 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 cartoon scripts and she used to do that in her class. During her class time, she she loved to to draw and and put in a cartoon. In fact, she's doing Adult Swim now. She's kind of doing stuff with Adult Swim yeah. and all of that. But but she actually did. Uh, Dan, they, they were trying to come up with a name, and Puff was wanted to come up with the Hearts or something like that. And they said that's kind of old, the Hearts, and da 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 da. And Dawn said, "What about Dan and Kane?" And he said, "Wow, I like that, Dan and Kane. That sounds good. Where you get that from?" And she said, "Well, I was, she was explaining." She said, "Well, yeah, let's use that, Dan and Kane." So he owns the right to Dan and Kane. Uh, uh, yeah, he owns, but she came up with it. He's and a smart businessman. Well. Either smart businessman or you have dumb people that's around you. And like I said, again, that's me. And that's why you won't see another song coming out of Chocolate Milk unless it's coming out of different. What about ways. a Frank Richard, Frank Richard record with a band? Now, that has been thought about. I mean, I, I, I just got to get the right band to do that. And, and I haven't gotten to that point yet. And I'm still trying i'm still an old guy but but i'm, I'm not at at that level like i was when i was young but but uh yeah that would be that was the only way that i got songs I got come on you used to work songs. a ups job all night you can do it yeah right you're right scott <laughs> you're right <laughs> but anyway you know now my daughter's doing it so a lot of uh help is going to that you know like i said daddy they can't it's it's very hard uh in the music industry if if you got to find the right people, it's got to be the right thing. But it's very hard for a person who's very very talented in the group, and everybody else know it, and they want to keep you down, and mm -hmm. that's hard. That that's the hard part. Michael Jackson went through it, even with his own brothers, and and uh, and and you should know. I mean, it is what that's just what it is. Dana DeCane was chosen, uh, and she was one of the five girls. Um, I didn't want her to go through it at all because I knew about P. Diddy. I knew about that. And he is a shrewd businessman, but he's also a knucklehead. He, he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of problems. And, 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 and I was worried about that. And yeah, so, I can't speak to his character. All I can say is that his bank account looks like he does okay. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. But qu qu quite. He's definitely that. And now he's shrewd at that. He's shrewd. I, I, you know, traveled with them, sort of things, you know, musically, uh, he he should be doing something else musically, but I can't argue with the money he's making. I can't argue that. But 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 here's the deal: when they came up with Danny the King, they got it all the way through the five girls. I never knew or would have known that my daughter would actually be a part of that. Not only would she be a part of it, but I didn't even think she would be like the girl. So she wrote the songs. Wow. 
they gave her, they gave her credit for it because you know again her dad learned the lesson and I hope to pass that on. So I said, mm-hmm. look, make sure you don't share it with the girls. The problem is again, like I said, you, it's a catch twenty two. If you don't share it, then you get way more animosity. Like I'm getting now, mm-hmm. they don't want to change. Yeah. They they want they want to share in all of it, but. I, I, I caused that problem, but I'm saying it is what it is in, 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 in this case. In this case, she wrote all the songs. She's getting credit for it, but the other girls are jealous, especially because Puff saw it the way he saw it. He couldn't have Dawn, a dark girl, be the face of Danity Kane and sell pop records. Mm-hmm. So he, so the thinking behind that was to have Aubrey O'Day be the face of Danity Kane so that they could sell records. She's sexy, she's a that, but she's also that face that everybody would like to like to have and be that. Problem wise, talent wise, she don't have it. So Dawn had to do all the vocals for her and do all of the things for her and do this and that and that. The problem is your your head gets big when you know you're the face of that and you're double yeah. Yeah. and you're, you're, that's hard. All right. And so, and me being the dad of Dawn. They respect that, but at the same time, they're looking at, well, that's his daughter, so I'm not letting him try to manage or tell me what to do. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I'm not taking his advice, you know, so. That's a hard place for you. And it's a very hard place, and so that's kind of what that happened. So it got to be a division kind of thing. So the, they were right there. They came up with the song uh, Damage. For the second album, the damage I got on every radio station possible. They was on American Music Awards. They was all over the place, and uh, and then they were ready to do another series, and they were ready to to get away from Puff to do that. But the lead Aubrey wanted it done her way, and that that rubbed the girls the wrong way, and then one after another they started dividing. And so, you know, that's kind of what that was. So they, they broke up. They actually came back together with three of them. Dawn tried it again, but they, it's just not going to work. Cause Sounds a little bit, yeah. reminds me of what happened with In Vogue. That's right, In Vogue, exactly. So this, this is not something that's very new. I'm just saying that's kind of what that is. And yeah. that's what, but, but chemistry-wise, they were crazy. Chemistry-wise, they were like the Beatles. They were... Mm-hmm. And so they sold that double platinum. I, I, Puffy, again, he's looked up as a genius, but he's also blessed because, again, I don't think he saw that coming. I don't think he did. I think he was looking to make the money off of making band. You get that big money from, the, from Fox and you get that money from the, from the TV stations. They pump it. They say, hey, let's get Puffy and have this like American Idol, da, 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 da. Yeah. He was going to just run it, get the money. And just run. Yeah, yeah. But but the group got big and it was yeah. getting bigger than him. Wow. It was getting bigger than him. And and he didn't know how to handle that. And cuts Puff is who he is. He knows how to make money for himself. But you yes. ever look around, he don't know how to make money for everybody else. It just so happened he had one other surprise. Biggie Small surprised him. Biggie got bigger than he could ever get. I mean, Biggie got big. He was bona fide. He was talented in the whole bit. And Puff happened to be a part of that. Yeah. And then when, and then and then Biggie died. But if you look around, Puff ain't had nobody else. He had people, but he ain't nobody's bigger than him. Yeah. You know, and that's because of what it. But anyway, that's where it is. Yeah. So that's why. Well, congratulations on your daughter's uh, success too, and just you know, um, following yeah. in your footsteps to some extent. She's doing her own, yeah. She's doing her own thing now and making her own way. And, uh, you know, hopefully she's like a, what we call nowadays, it's called an indie artist. So you don't have to have uh, well, a, a label like like back in the day we were worried about. Technology, so, man, and the internet. Technology. <laughs> that's why we're here right now. Yeah, that's where you go. And I know nothing about it. So my daughter would have been uh, to hook us up right really quickly. As slow as I was, you saw how long it took me. So, but <laughs> hey, uh, Frank, Frank, I really appreciate all the time you spent with me. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's gone longer yeah, exactly. than I, I had intended. But I want yeah. to ask you one more question before we part ways. Yeah, and so it's got to be a doozy, right? Yeah. And my question is, um, how would you sum up the chocolate milk sound? What made chocolate milk and continues to 
unique, and how would you like the group to be remembered? Um, I, I, I guess first to be remembered by, by our, we, we accidentally came up on what Alan Toussaint had come up with. I really liked uh, the vocals uh, matching the horns. I thought that was something that was different and it, the way it was done had a lot of uh, had a lot of had a lot of identity to it, and 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 the way we did it actually created that. So I was trying to create that again. It's just unfortunate, like I said, we didn't sell the records all over the place like we should have. If Girl Calling would have been all over the way I thought it would have been, you know, the way you heard it to be, and where the the celebrities thought we were going when we were going with it, um, I think that would have been the sound. That would have been our sound, and that would have took us where we were, where, you know, where where we would have been remembered as. Wow, you know, those guys, you know, when, when the singer sang, you know, get that door and da 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 da, everything would have been the same because that's how we 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 spoke the same the same language when we when we came out, and that's kind of how we, Girl Calling was produced. I mean, we didn't uh, we didn't say okay, we're gonna sing this note and we're gonna play this note. It it, it just came out that way. Well, we we did it in the studio, and and Amadi played. You know, I call him. We call him Day Day. When, when he played that that melody, he said da 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 da. And I would put, I wouldn't change it, baby. If I had my way, I would stay with you forever. And we did that together, and it was so like on point. And Alan was like, "Wow, let's do that again, and let's let's let's." Let's do another one like. Let's do one with Joe like that. And it was so nice that the the horn players could actually play melodies that would speak in the way it spoke. That I could actually translate that to English so everybody else can get it. it, it was that make sense? It, it was light in touch. Yeah. Still delivered a, a hard funk groove feel. Yeah, yeah, it did have that. It had that heart, and I, I think. I think when you look at that part from from the instrumentation part on that end where where it comes from the bottom and all of that guitar and bass that's what you felt. You felt that and you felt that syncopation it was backwards. We never had we had songs like um uh back in the day there was uh Chaka Khan and Rufus and Rufus had a song that went bottom love me bottom and so we had the feeling almost backwards, but we had something similar. Yeah, you got the love. Ray and Parker Jr. Song, song called. It, it was Ray Parker Jr. song, and yeah. we toured with him, by the way, as a guitar. You know, he, he, when we when he did the radio kind of song. Uh, but um, uh, but anyway, that that um, uh, that kind of funk we had. Da 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 but um, but was kind of similar to but up, love me. But we had that feel of what that was, and we kind of sometimes we change it and 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 what everybody else have, we just change it and tweak it just a little bit to make it feel like us, uh, yeah. feel like that that gumbo. So if, if that if that gives you for the bottom for the bottom for the horn players, which I thought was the the, the upfront sound. That's kind of what we got. So when Immature took that that sound, they had a song called uh, uh, "I Never from Chicago." Immature group that that did uh, "You Got It." They did that. They took our track and put "You Got It." They just took my voice off and uh, uh, "We Got It." It's "You Got It." We Got It. Whatever by Immature, and they did the, They did our track, mm -hmm. and that's that was kind of how people did during those times. They would uh, they would. Uh, uh, when we call it take the track, they would um uh and they're still doing that now, you know. They they interpolate they, it. Uh yeah, I forgot the what's the I'm missing the word, but sample, interpolate. Sample. They they would sample, you know, yeah. So that that was a sample track, and when they just took the voice off and put it and put into it. Um uh, uh girl call that show you how big girl call it was for immature to even try to do it. And and all those other people that was trying to, you know do it but then it fizzled and when it fizzled everybody just backed off of it but what's you know. uh what's your message to the people out there that continue to embrace chocolate milk and beef fans and, and well what, what we, we 
as anybody else, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking everybody else because in my mind, I always wanted to make a difference. And so um, if, if we got a chance to make a difference in, in everybody in, in such a way where it changed their lives, because a lot of people would come back and say, man, how about love? I, 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 I created this beautiful baby and it was off of your record and da, 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 da. And, you know, it changed my life. And some people were in, you know, I was in a cell and I was down and I heard your song and, you know, it really lifted me and action speaks loud. And so what I get out of that is that, uh, our purpose again is if we could really make a difference in a positive way to, to, to help us get through our wonderful struggles. Cause we have, I call them wonderful because there are struggles and sometimes we can't see that, that the struggles that we're having, they're bad for us at the time, but they're good for us. And, and, and those struggles help us get better. Um, you know, uh, the political side of it, you know, the racism and this, that, you know, all of those things, they're bad, but they're good for us. They, 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 they get into our inner and, and, and say, hey, we can be better than this. We can, we can do better. We can get better. And we need to do better and we need to get better. We just got to do it one at a time. If we never speak on it, if we never talk about it and we throw it around and we act like we don't see it, then we don't get better. And so that was the object of all of it is just to, how can we make a difference, you know, in a positive way? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I got to say there's few that did better than... Mm -hmm. Chuck Milk and Mr. Frank Richard. So thank you so much. For thank you. you. It's been a, a great pleasure talking to you and hearing all this great history. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, after spending all that delightful time with Frank Richard, if you're anything like me, you have a new appreciation for Chocolate Milk, the albums, the songs, their conquests, and their challenges. More than 40 years after becoming a fan, sucked in by Girl Cullen, I now feel much more musically enriched, or maybe better expressed as enriched, as a tip of the hat to Mr. Frank Richard. In fact, a final thanks out to Chocolate Milk's class act, Mr. Frank Richard. And a sincere thank you to you, our viewers and listeners. Much appreciate the support. Be sure to look out for upcoming episodes of Truth and Rhythm and catch up with previous installments of FunkinStuff.net on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading podcast providers. Be sure to subscribe to Truth and Rhythm. If you're not already subscribed, what is going on? Go to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. Click subscribe. It's that easy. Never miss a Truth and Rhythm episode. Get friends and family subscribed. If you love the artists that we're bringing you, if you appreciate what they've done, the art they've brought us, the joy they bring us, funk, R&B, jazz, show your support. And I want to hear from you. Drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you want to see on the show. It's your program. It's a two-way exchange. So keep the emails coming. I'm getting a lot of them, hearing from folks, and uh, it's great. So keep it up, and um, you know we'll see what we can do about getting whoever you want to see on the show. For now, until next time, as always, this is Scott, Dr. Jiggs Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.